Trying to hold a band together is like trying to hold a marriage together with, with multiple partners. You can't do it forever. Not everybody is U2 or the Stones. You know, most bands will have a, a limited shelf life. And that's always been really disappointing to me when a, when a band gets to the point where it's obvious, okay, time to move on. Welcome to Intersect Radio, where music, faith, and life converge. With your host, Aaron the A Train Smith. everybody to Intersect Radio here on the Intertalk Radio Network. Thank you all for dialing in. A shout out to our sponsors, Pitbull Audio and Studio Instrument Rentals. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting Intertalk Radio. We have uh, for the our guest today, uh, a friend of mine, a bandmate, um, one guy who's been in CCM, that's contemporary Christian music for all you people that don't know the genre uh, for quite some time. He's been with some really, yeah, some really big groups, yeah. and uh, and uh, he's he's still plugging away at it, folks. So, give a big shout out and a big round of applause to my guest today, Mr. Matthew Chapman. Thanks, Aaron. I sure appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks for saying yes, baby. Yeah, the, you the, the massive uh, massive audience that we have. I know. <laughs> They're listening. How you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, so we need to come up with some really entertaining things for uh, people to hear today. <laughs> Let's get all you started. Have to do is, all you have to do is tell us about Matthew Chapman, and I'm sure those interesting things will just roll off. <laughs> okay. Well, Let's you know, start. you... You've uh, you you just told um, told me earlier that you had in- interviewed Phil Keggy recently, and yeah. that reminded me that uh, most of the the musicians that I know from our generation uh, started playing music or wanted to be in a band because they saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I am no exception to that. Uh, you know, it it cool. changed uh, changed everything. You know, I first wanted to be a musician, but when I came to know God, uh, I, I wanted to put the two together and uh, uh, share my love for God and my love for music both. So I've been really fortunate since 1973 to uh, be able to do just that with some amazing players. Um, yeah. So it's been a it's been a really good run. Okay, before before we get to that part though, let's go way back. Uh, to Redlands, way, California. Way back. I don't think that far back very often. Oh, come on. Redlands, February the 7th. What year was that? Uh, I was born actually in Glendale, California, uh, February oh, 7, 1956. 1956. Wow, man. Yeah, so like? I am a, a native Californian, and in fact, my... Uh, my family tree uh, enjoys the distinction of having the original Anglo resident of Southern California. And so, who was the original? Uh, Joseph Chapman, he was uh, Shanghai onto a pirate ship in Honolulu Harbor and ended up uh, uh, in Santa Barbara. Um, this pirate uh, ship engaged the dawn of Santa Barbara in this epic battle, and the pirates lost. And my uh, my relative was uh, captured, and they found out that he wasn't actually a pirate, and he had construction skills. So they put him to work, and that was uh, eighteen eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I don't think he really owned that distinction, but for uh, for one brief moment, he uh, he was hanging with the pirates. 
Uh, dude, that would have been so great. I've always wanted to hang out with pirates. That would have been cool. I got my well, I guess you could move to down. Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what happened after you were born? <laughs> <laughs> After I was born, well, you know, I don't really remember, but uh, um, we we stayed in California. My dad was a public school teacher, and uh, uh-huh. um, my mom uh, ended up uh, having a, a long career in education as well. Uh, okay. So both my parents were teachers, um, administrators, and I grew up around education. You have siblings? Yes, a younger brother and a younger sister. There's uh, uh, two years and nine months between me and my younger sister, and our brother is sandwiched in between us. So okay. close, close together in age. Okay. So uh, was church part of your uh, childhood, going to church? It, like it was. Um, it, it was interesting, though, because my experience with church was uh, was really pretty negative. Uh, it was people um, trying to c- control behavior and control the outside, and I didn't really uh, feel like it, people had concern for my heart or what was really going on inside me. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was... Uh, 1971, and I was uh, hitchhiking around Northern California, and I met a young couple that looked like me. Uh, uh, they uh, had guy had long hair, and uh, they uh, were considered at that time to be part of the hippie culture, you know. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I spent a week with them, and they talked about Jesus like he was right there with them all the time. Like he was part really? of their conversation. Like, yeah. And I had never experienced anything like that before. And it, it completely blew me away. And uh, after spending a week with them, they were all packed up in their car, ready to, ready to drive off. And I was going to go back to my pe- tent and pack up my stuff. And the last thing they told me was that they would be praying for me. And mm-hmm. nobody had ever said anything like that to me before and showed an interest in, in my heart and my soul. And at that point I, I decided I've got to figure out what they have and I need to get some of that. So, so I, I go, spent, where me? did you go after, where did you go after you guys said goodbye? I mean, where were you? I went back home. Okay. Yeah. I, I went back home and I didn't know any other Christians like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just used to read my Bible every night on the edge of my bed and uh, uh, would would pray uh, to to God for for an experience with Him and uh, an experience with other believers. And it wasn't until my first year of college that I met some other Christians that that I could really connect with and identify with. And mm-hmm. then uh, the following summer, uh, 1974. I moved down to Southern California to play in a band with uh, a bunch of guys that are still uh, my some of my best friends in the whole world. So and you were playing uh, bass during all this time? Uh, I was, mm-hmm. yes. So you were playing in local bands or what? Uh, I was. Uh, where I lived in Northern California, there were not a lot of opportunities for rock bands, but mm-hmm. I... Uh, uh, got in with uh, a guy that I guess probably would have been considered more of a lounge type singer. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in his early twenties and I was 15 when I started playing with him. But, uh, the wineries up in St. Helena area where I lived, St. Helena, California, uh, were just expanding into, uh, more of entertainment venues and they were having dinners paired with wine and, and all that kind of stuff. And he got in uh, with a number of the wineries there doing their entertainment. So um, I was 15, 16 doing that and uh, making some seriously good money for a 15-year-old bass player. Wow. So, yeah. So did you leave that so, and, and go hitchhiking? Is, is that what happened? 
Yeah, uh, you know that was early seventies. That was when when people would would just take off and hitchhike wherever they wanted to go, and mm-hmm. uh, it was a different world back then. You know mm-hmm. that there there were people that would hitchhike, and there were people that would pick them up, and and there was a connection. You know between. Yeah. Why'd you leave such a cush gig? Uh, well, you know, you know, Randy Thomas, um, yes. mm-hmm. and, uh, he gave me a call. I had met him through a mutual friend in, uh, down in Southern California on a couple of occasions. Uh, but he called me up, uh, late spring, 1974 and, uh, said, Hey, our bass player moved to Arizona. We need a bass player. Come down and play with us. And, uh, so I did that. We were all still teenagers, uh, but mm-hmm. we lived in a, a house together in, in Southern California and, uh, and we played, uh, wow. we played all over Southern California, went up into the Bay area a few times, um, uh, went up to Fresno, uh, quite a few times. Mm-hmm. Were you still in high school? No, I, uh, I left high school when I was 17 and, uh, just went to college. So, <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, high school and I were not a real good fit. <laughs> so, I, so you had all your credits and everything, so you could just yeah. leave. Oh, yeah. Go to yeah, they, yeah. They mailed me a uh, 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 diploma a year after I left, but uh, there wasn't any, any way to really accelerate back then. Yeah. I guess that's one advantage of uh, growing up in the house of two, with two educators, huh? Uh, probably. <laughs> Probably, but I was just, yeah, I was ready. What college, what college did you go to? I went to a college in Northern California called Pacific Union College for one year, and then I went to Valley College in Southern California for two years. I uh, went to UC Riverside for a year, went to Sonoma State back up in Northern California for a year, and then uh, two years at, at Cal State San Bernardino. Wow. What were you studying all this time? Everything. <laughs> really? Everything. I just, I love school. And if I was home long enough, I'd enroll in classes. So wow. I, I, yeah, I was just a perpetual student. That's cool, man. And you were playing bass all this time as well? Every, I was playing, yes, yeah, I was, I, I was playing, um, but if, if I wasn't actually touring, then I'd, I'd pick up as many classes as I could fit in. <laughs> you know, that sounds just like you, Matt. <laughs> oh, it is you. <laughs> it's the very same. <laughs> so what happened after, um, so you're in California, you're going you're all over California because all these are California universities and colleges. Yeah, right? but I was I was mostly in Southern California, and uh, mm-hmm. I was playing with friends of mine. Um, you know, doing all Christian music, um, and we do everything from uh, youth youth camps to uh, church programs to outdoor uh, park concerts on a flatbed uh, uh, trailer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, did uh, 1982, I spent uh, four months in Europe uh, playing with Youth for Christ and Youth with a Mission and doing, doing uh, Youth for Christ coffee bars and YWAM. How did you get into just playing Christian music? I mean, how did You know, that, uh, honestly, how did it start? was uh, the first... Um, the first uh, Maranatha compilation album uh, had love song and uh, and uh, children of the day and and a number of of other artists on it. it was the very first album and I think it came out in seventy one maybe um, but I got a hold of that and it just it it completely changed everything for me. I thought okay if somebody else is doing that I can do that. And so I found some some other musicians that were Christians. Uh, uh, this was uh, seventy three, and uh, we started doing Christian music in Northern California. And uh, 
uh, we would get a high school gymnasium and uh, get a PA in, in there and um, pass out flyers, and we'd get five or 600 kids coming to a concert. Well, that's, that's interesting because, you know, a lot of uh, musicians who end up uh, in the CCM music um, world, they usually start it like playing clubs or something, you know, and and then somebody witnessed to them or they had some some life event happen that kind of got their attention. But you just you just naturally just gravitated towards that. Well, and, you know, 17, I know at 17 you were playing clubs, but most 17-year-olds weren't. And uh, I was like that. You know, I wasn't playing any clubs. I, I didn't have any of those connections or uh, doing that kind of material. And I, we usually, I usually uh, did original things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we'd write our, we'd write our own songs and, and then find a place where people wanted to hear them. Okay. And they were all Which, Christian uh, lyrics all the time? Yes. Uh-huh. Wow. That's interesting. You know, and it was, you uh, it, it, it was an interesting, interesting time interesting? back then. Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, you understand how that's interesting, right? Because you just kind of, you just kind of gravitated towards just playing Christian music and, and ministering through music, you know? It, it was it was important to me uh, at that point in my relationship with God that I whatever talent whatever ability I had I wanted to give back to to Him and uh, um, you know use use that to to bring recognition to God and not uh, you know necessarily build a career for myself. Okay, all right, that's cool. So you uh, what happened after you went to Europe? Um, <laughs> I came home and I thought, well, it's time to grow up. It's time to, to get serious about finding a real job. And I went back to school. Um, and I was, I was at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, taking computer science classes when, uh, Randy called me up again and said, Hey, um, you know, um, uh, sweet comfort band just broke up and, and, uh, I'm going to put a new band together. Uh, would you play bass? And that was a really interesting phone call because two weeks before that, I found myself sitting at the the computer terminal at Cal State San Bernardino, just writing code, and spontaneously prayed, God, if this is what you want me to do with my life, I will do the very best I can. But if you have anything else for me, please let me know. Because this really isn't what I have in mind. And, Get me out uh, of here, please. Yeah, exactly. And it was two weeks after that that Randy called me up, and that was the the beginning of Allies. Sam Scott had been living over in Holland, and he moved back. Um, and the three of us had been in a band called Sunrise together when we were teenagers. And uh, we played a lot with a band called Psalm 150, and uh, Bob Carlisle and Jimmy Erickson were in that band. We we went to church together, and you know, so the roots of Allies goes back to all of us being teenagers out of, out of the same church in Southern California, and uh, then he came back together in 1984, and uh, we did uh, six albums for Light and Word Records. Wow. Six records, huh? Did you tour those records? As we well? did. Uh, we we toured quite a bit. Um, we used to go to Europe two to three times a year. Um, mm-hmm. And and I, I know that we're supposed to be doing this interview like I don't really know you, but I remember you playing a Flavo <laughs> Festival just about every year over there usually with charlie peacock but i think you went over there with some other artists as well but uh now you were uh, you were usually later in the lineup than we were though (laughs) you think so they they usually gave you this really plum uh closing (laughs) slot so that's how you got to nashville joining allies 
Uh, no, no. Allies no? was based out of Southern California, and in in okay. 1990, Bob moved back to Nashville to do a, a solo gig, and Randy ended up moving back the end of 1990. Um, to uh, be a staff writer for a, a big publishing company. And uh, um, we did our last date, uh, New Year's Eve, Knott's Berry Farm, 1990, going into, into 91. Um, mm. But then Bob and Randy had a budget for one more Allies album, and they went ahead and put a band together in Nashville uh, and uh, did uh, Man with a Mission. Okay. But the thing that brought me back to Nashville was was not music at all. It was getting married and having three kids. Okay. Yeah. I get that, man. So, yeah. It's a lot easier to so, live here with a wife and three kids than in So that Southern was Cal. that was a really good move from my family and uh my oldest now is uh graduating from high school and That's going right. up cool. to Center That's College right. in Kentucky to play football. Yeah, what position? Uh, he's uh defensive end. <clears throat> cool, man. He's taller than you now. He's a lot Oh yeah, than he would oh, he passed me up uh right after he turned 13. Wow. So yeah, he's he's about 6'4 and 230 now. Mm, man. Look out. So yeah, tell me what happened? I don't mess with why, him. Why did uh allies in um, uh, honestly, I think, uh, I think Bob, um, didn't really want the responsibility of a band. He was ready to just do his own albums and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a great band and, and I really enjoyed working with him and we always got along really well. We never had any issues, but mm-hmm. I think he just got to the point where, he didn't want to have to include other people in decisions and and uh stylistic uh direction you know mm-hmm. he he was ready to just do his own thing yeah the band politic yeah and i can understand that you know allies was together about 8 years i was together for about 7 of that mm-hmm. so what did you do after that um, I, uh, one of my, uh, really good friends, in fact, at the time we were, um, housemates, uh, he played guitar with, uh, Daryl Mansfield. Mm-hmm. And so he, uh, when I was free from allies, he said, Hey, we're going to need a bass player. You should, uh, you should play with Daryl. So I did, uh, did that for three and a half years. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. And then, um, then you guys, um, you guys there was an overlap, with but Daryl, right? But pardon me. You played a lot. With, you played a lot with Daryl in Europe. They seem to enjoy the blues and the harmonica. Yes, and it was yeah. interesting because you know, like I said, I'd been going over to Europe two to three times a year for a number of years at that point, early nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, and Daryl had been going over to Japan and I'd never had a chance to go to Japan. Uh, mm-hmm. and so when I first started playing with him, he had this whole tour booked in Japan already. And right after I started playing with him, he canceled that whole tour and did his, uh, second trip over to, to Europe instead, mm-hmm. which was great because I had a lot of friends over there and, and I've always enjoyed going over to Europe, but I, I was disappointed that I didn't get a chance to go to Japan. Yeah. Have you been yet? No, no, I need to go. Yeah. You need to go, man. It's just, you know how it is though. Uh, It's I've traveled a lot, but I've, I've really only traveled to places where people paid me to play. (laughs) I know that's the only way to go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I can't afford to, you know, go to the other side of the world on my dime. I so, know. What would you do, you know? Walk around? I don't even know. I don't something? even know because I so enjoyed uh, connecting with people. And, you know, I I made good friends over in Europe, and some people I'm, I'm still in contact with. We did uh, a festival in Norway five years in a row. 
and a couple of the guys that were involved in in promoting that festival, I'm still in contact with. It was a Christian festival in Norway? Yes. Huh. Yeah, it was uh, uh, the English translation, I think, was Seaside Fest. Okay. Summertime, I take it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Man, I love Norway. I went I went there once uh, with Ronnie oh. and Floyd. It was great. Oh, so that was early on. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, we were there for like two days. Man, it was great. Had a great time. Yeah, they, they used to bring us over for at least a week because um, they, they say the airfare was cheaper if, uh, if it extended over a week instead of just in and out. And right. it was cheaper for them to fly us in and put us up for a week than to just fly us in right back out the next day. So um, did, that, was a, that was a great hang. Yeah. Did you go to church there or play at church there while you were there? Um, I never had that opportunity. Mm-hmm. I would have loved to, but mm-hmm. but I did okay. uh, I did pick up some other gigs, and um, I was I did do a club thing uh, for a while when I was playing with Daryl, um, and I backed up a buddy of mine by the name of Sean Jones, and then uh, when Bob Anglin uh, left Daryl's band, uh, I brought Sean in to, to uh, play guitar, which was a mm-hmm. real natural. Uh, extension and uh, we were over in in uh, in Norway and uh, Steve Latin Nation was playing drums on that trip yeah. so and Steve and, and Sean and I did this club thing together so we had hours worth of material and a buddy of mine was a bouncer for a club and we were over there and he uh, asked if we'd be able to come over and play it at the club that he worked at. And I said, sure. So we played there two nights, and everybody, all the artists from the festival came over and hung out and would do a song or two. And the place was just packed. And the owner of the club was a real famous artist. And the second night, he came in, and he gave us some of his uh, prints of his paintings that I found out after the fact sold for about a thousand dollars a piece. Wow. Which, which I still have. But, uh, my buddy, after the second night, he came up to me literally with tears in his eyes. And he said, this is the greatest gift that anybody's given me Oh man! because we, we, because of him, we packed out the club for two nights with, with people being turned away at the door and, you know, all the artists from the festival going through there. And, uh, it was just a real spontaneous, um, uh, my buddy, Sean did, um, uh, mostly blues and blues rock. And, uh, he, he was a real fiery player. Um, and that band broke up when, uh, Waylon Jennings was asked to go out, uh, on Lollapalooza with, uh, Metallica and share main stage with Metallica. So uh, Waylon didn't take his pedal steel player. He called up Sean, and they were friends, and uh, mm-hmm. asked Sean if, uh, if he would go out with him. And Sean never uh, didn't come back to California after that. He stayed in Nashville. <laughs> never looked so, back, huh? Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you, so you really never had a lot of experience playing the Smoky Club with uh, – people getting drunk and no, not so much. Um, in, in, in 82, um, uh, youth with a mission got us into, uh, some of the clubs in Amsterdam. They'd been working on that for quite a while. And the Mm -hmm. band that I went over there with just kind of walked into, uh, some of the, some of the, the work that they had had done to open things up. They asked us if we'd go over to this, uh, one club in the Zadike in, in Amsterdam called the last water hole. And okay. we walked in there and, and, uh, asked for the, the manager and he came out and we said, Hey, we're a band from California and we're over here. And before we could even finish, he interrupted and said, my band just quit. Can you guys play tonight? 
And <laughs> we said, sure. <laughs> so, um, and that, that kind of sure. opened some things up for some, some Christian bands. Uh, it was really interesting because all the songs that we had were originals and we had plenty of material, but, um, it was all, uh, message oriented, um, uh, uh, lyrics. And so we were doing that and uh, this last water hole turned out to be a hash bar. And yeah. so we're, we're doing this stuff in, in a hash bar in the Zadike and in Amsterdam. And, uh, but People appreciated it because we we were just playing. We weren't trying to hit anybody over the head with it. We were just yeah. being ourselves, and and it went over surprisingly well. Man, that's great. That's great. We used to do – well, you did Flavo Fest, right? Uh, yeah, I did that in 82 for the first time, and then uh, quite a few times in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's my experience with Holland. Well – Amsterdam. Well, yeah, no, I played. Uh, I played in Amsterdam with uh, Romeo Void at the Paradiso. Yeah, that was weird. I mean, just the, the <laughs> venue itself, you know, because it's a it's an old church. Yes, and it's black and white, painted black and white on the outside, and the cross on top of the church is black. And you yeah. know the club. You know the club is open because the cross rocks to and fro. Mm. That's that's the opening sign. You know? Yeah, yeah, and I I, I think it's still there. I think it's still it open. It is. Yeah. I just I just saw a great concert on YouTube that was filmed there just recently. It's still there. So, um, yep. tell me, um. Let's talk about uh, what you're doing now, this thing uh, you're doing with Yuzu. Um, That is a U2 tribute band, and uh, it is probably the most accurate of all the U2 tributes. Um, uh, I I wear this Adam Clayton wig, and and, uh, it's, it's a little scary even to me how much I look like him when I put this thing on. It's it's weird, <laughs> but uh, the the guitar player for Yuzu is the one that uh, uh, kind of runs the band. He put it together, and uh, he is a real stickler for doing the arrangements exactly like U two does live. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he uses tracks exactly the way that U two had them, uh, and will do the arrangement exactly like a particular concert. Um, that they did, and uh, what about uh, guitar solos? Uh, you're talking about the edge. Yeah, does he mimic the edge? He does. Yeah, note for note. Yeah, he's he's got it down. But you know, the the edge just does not launch out on an extended guitar solos outside <laughs> of the arrangement. That that doesn't ever happen. So, right. Well, that's cool. So when you say you're the most accurate. You're accurate uh, aesthetically and musically. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I I am not that much of a hardcore U2 fan. I really appreciate the band. I've seen them a number of times, but I don't really follow them. But um, my buddy Chris, who's a guitar player, uh, he's in that whole scene. He's in the middle of that whole scene. He knows all the people that run all the fan clubs, and uh, uh, he blogs and uh, and communicates with uh, you know all the all the fans and stuff. And he's pretty well known in those circles. Um, we we do. Um, <laughs> try to to get it right down to the smallest detail um yeah, as far as the arrangements go it's it's uh note for note exactly what they played in a certain concert wow so you use do you use uh live recordings as your source or do you use records yes. as your source no 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 it's it's all from the live recording okay yeah, we don't cool. we don't even really reference the the studio recordings. We don't do uh, any studio arrangements at all. Mm-hmm. 
So do you uh, do a show uh, song for song as if uh, like you two's last Chicago performance or something like that? You do that set list? We, when I first started playing with Chris a few years ago, um, we would um, play clubs and we'd start at uh, nine o'clock and play until two uh, oh, and play straight through. Really? Um, oh, yeah. We, we, it's, we, we didn't like taking breaks. So <laughs> we've got, you know, four and a half hours, five hours worth of, of U2 music that we can play. Um, and uh, but it's it's uh, cut back now to where we usually do a, a two hour show um, mm -hmm. and usually in a in a theater like uh, uh, House of Blues or Hard Rock. And uh, we play we, we play the Fillmore's uh, as well. And uh, so it's usually a two hour show that we do. And um Lately, it's uh, we've had a theme like it's uh, focused on a certain album or a certain period or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a certain set that they did uh, at one point in time. Mm -hmm. wow. So how, in some of the places play? like mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple dates to the end of this month, um, you know, it's it kind of. Uh, We'll we'll get a, a bunch of dates all at once, and then we'll take a break. The um, Chris is a, a programmer for uh, Dave Ramsey, and I don't know if any of the listeners know who Dave Ramsey is, but um, mm -hmm. uh, Chris is is part of a, a really big stable of programmers there, and he's on mm -hmm. kind of a short leash. So he yeah. takes all of his vacation time to to go do uh, dates out, but he's pretty selective on what he books, um, just because it's going to be a vacation day for him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't so know we, that. we I play uh, down in Atlanta at, uh, a oh. uh, place called mad life regularly. Uh, a couple other places in Atlanta that we play regularly. And, um, then, uh, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll do some of the, um, the, uh, house of blues, Myrtle beach, um, mm. A couple of the film wars. Would you say those are mostly Christian audiences? No, not at all. No. Yeah, no. this. Yeah, I. I don't. I'm sure there are probably Christians in the audience, but I wouldn't. Oh yeah. Wouldn't know. Yeah, there's got to be a at least one Christian in every audience, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a rule. <laughs> there's a law somewhere. <laughs> I remember playing this club once with the 77s in Oakland and they had a security check and they were uh -huh. asking people, they were asking people if they had any cans, guns, knives. And Mark Tudel and I just happened to be standing at the door because we, we had gone out to walk, just walk up and down the street before the show. And, and we came back in and we were standing right there at the door when the security guard asked this kid if he had a gun or a knife and he held up his Bible and he says, I don't have a knife, but I have my sword. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Only, only 77s would, would draw an audience like that to a club though. <laughs> oh boy. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. You guys That's really covered times. some territory. <laughs> yeah. So tell me something. Well, uh, of all of all the things you've done, what was your what was your biggest joy in your musical career and as a, and as a believer? Honestly, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is just sharing the stage with my best friends. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to travel the world with guys that I came up with, and I. I have been really, really fortunate to always be in bands with musicians that are a lot better than I am. And, uh, so, you know, it's, uh, I spent in allies, I spent, uh, six going on seven years, uh, with Bob Carlisle and Randy Thomas, who, uh, won a Grammy award for, uh, for song of the year. Yeah. But you know, and, right? 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is the funniest thing because that's probably the least representative song that Bob ever did. <laughs> okay. But, uh, wow. but that's what he's yeah. known for now. And, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, Bob and, and Randy uh, wrote for Bob solo things. They they wrote together in Allies, but they also wrote together for a number of other artists. And uh, mm-hmm. they just always would assign themselves. Let's see if we can write a song like this because uh, before they moved back to uh, um, Nashville, uh, we had a studio in California, Southern California, and and they would just check in every day and. Uh, you know, give themselves an assignment if if we didn't have any allies stuff coming up. And uh, one day, one day they said, uh, "Let's see if we can write a country song." So they wrote this country song and demoed it. And a friend of ours got it to Dolly Parton, and she recorded it. And it, I think it was uh, the country song of the year, uh, really? 19, 1988 or eighty nine, somewhere in there. What's but, the yeah, a song called. Yeah, why'd you come in here looking like that? Oh, man. Randy and, and uh, Bob wrote that, huh? Yeah, they wrote it. And uh, wow. um, Dolly heard it and loved it and made a big hit out of it. Mm-hmm. And that's that's really what got Bob and Randy looking at Nashville. Uh-huh. You know, getting yeah. getting that kind of success with that song on their first first time out trying to write a country song. Yeah, and, that makes uh, sense. So yeah. So what? Tell me, uh, what what would you say was your biggest disappointment? Um, well, you know, trying to hold a band together is like trying to hold a marriage together with with multiple partners. It's, right. It, it it you can't do it forever. It, it just right. doesn't work forever. You know, it's uh, not everybody is you two or the Stones. You know, most bands mm-hmm. will have a, a limited shelf life, and that's always been really disappointing to me when a when a band gets to the point where it's obvious, okay, time to move on. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. there usually is that moment, but yeah, I but I hate it. I, yeah. I don't like it. It's better if that moment doesn't come as a result of a fight or an argument. Yeah, and I that it never has for any of the bands that I've been in. It never happened because of a fight. Um, but there, there just is always that moment where it's obvious time to move on. Mm-hmm. And I was in a, I was in a band called Brighton for a, a couple of years, and. It four great players. It you know it should have done really really well, and we were over in Europe uh, one time working with a promoter who was a real good friend of mine, and I'd worked with him on a number of occasions over the ten years plus prior to that, and we uh, we did this show, and. It was good, but it wasn't great. And afterwards, he pulled me aside and he said, I have to tell you, this band is never going to be what you want it to be. Who told you and that? The, the promoter told me that. Oh, wow. You know, we were good enough friends that, that he just laid it out. You know, it was, mm-hmm. it was a good band. and We put it, we put it across a, a good set, but it just wasn't great. Mm-hmm. And... You know, sometimes you can take great players and put them together and it doesn't necessarily make a great band. And this was yeah. one of those occasions. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't too long after that that we just went four different directions. And nobody nobody had a fight. Nobody didn't like each other. It's just everybody went on to something else. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Well, you're, you're playing um, uh, at church these days, right? I go to Grace Chapel and I'm part of the worship team there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's uh, there's some amazing players over there, and uh, um, you know Tim Calhoun, yeah. and uh, he's he plays there probably half the rotation. Mm-hmm. How many guys you got on the worship team there? Oh, 
Oh, all together? You know, we've never had everybody together in one place at one time, but there are probably 70, 70 players in the pool. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's the advantage of having a church in Nashville. Oh, I know. Great players. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're they're all, they're all really, all the really good players. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, almost every church has a great worship team here. Yeah, and it's a funny thing because in California, in all the churches, if they're even mid-sized, they pay their musicians really well. Yeah. And you come back to Nashville, and most churches don't pay. They're starting right. to now, um, but uh, the tradition here is that um, they they don't play, they don't pay. They're yeah. uh, Sunday morning musicians. Right. They don't pay at my church, and they were they were really never actually think to do it. Yeah, and I I don't have a problem with that. I don't either. I don't either. You know, especially we, we especially lost. with my church. You know, that's that's my gift to my church. So I'm I'm happy mm -hmm. to to not charge. Yeah, but there yeah, are there are players, players that. Pardon me. I said we've lost some younger players who were in, like music majors in school and stuff because um, playing on Sunday is part of their income. You know. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you, like I said, there are, there are some churches around Nashville that are starting to, to pay uh, better, but you get a county away from Davidson County and mm -hmm. uh, the churches pay pretty well. Mm. And I've got I've yeah. got some friends that uh, contract for some larger churches uh, uh, outside, you know, like 45, 50 minutes from Nashville and mm -hmm. uh and they they, they pay contract pretty well. with the church. Uh, that uh, I've got some friends that uh, they they line up the players. Okay. So yeah, yeah. they they've got a job and it, just yeah. contracting uh, musicians. So they schedule players for every Sunday morning. Man, that's great. Yeah. So we're um, we're kind of getting to the end of our hour here. Um, what would you like the listeners to uh, know most about you? And um, is there anything you'd like to say to the audience in general that uh, is on your heart, uh, you think is important? Oh, well, I, I just want to tell people that I love God and I love people, and uh, I love when the two come together. God and people. It's great. <laughs> it is. Pardon me. That's. I said, yeah. That that's a great combination. God and people come. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Yeah. What What are you reading? And, you know, if, if I, I would just say this, if if there's uh -huh. someone listening that um, it, it doesn't know God or they have a, a an idea of church as being uh, really controlling and finger pointing and judgmental. Um, I just challenge them to to check out who God really is, because there are a lot of people that misrepresent God and and mm -hmm. give give people that don't know God a really bad impression of who God is. Right. And uh, God God has nothing but love for humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, if someone isn't experiencing that, I'd challenge them go find it because it's it's absolutely worth it. Yes, it is. What are you reading these days? Um, <laughs> my kids' high school textbooks. <laughs> um, yeah, I, oh, I don't have a whole lot of time for, for sitting down with a good book right now. You mean you're not going to it's, college? Not at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like I said, I've got three kids in high school right now. And like I said earlier, my oldest is getting ready to graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, things are just slammed right now just crazy mm -hmm. but it's all yeah, good it. yeah man uh so uh, congratulations on getting cole through high school man i know he's had yeah he's had yeah it, it's so exciting football yeah they had a they had a ceremony in front of the whole school yesterday where where he and his best friend who are both going to center college to be uh, defensive ends they're going to be bookends on the defensive line and they had a signing ceremony yesterday and 
and the whole school was there cheering and um, photographers and yeah, it was a big deal. And that's great. Did you have a signing day? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I suppose that was yesterday. There weren't okay, there yesterday. weren't any of the coaches from Center College that were there, but they've come down mm-hmm. on a number of occasions to meet with the guys. And... Mm-hmm. Man, that's great. Yeah, it I is spent, very cool. You spent a lot of time at a lot of Friday night football games, my friend. Oh, yeah. So now it's going to be Friday night with my younger son and Saturday yeah. with my older son. So it's Man. a lot of jetting around. How far is that from Nashville? Three and a half okay. hours. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's not bad. And when does he go to school? Uh, he goes, He I think he reports the early part of August. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. So well, it hey, is man, exciting. Um, well, I just want to say thank you for being on the show. And uh, you're a faithful brother, a faithful friend. You got a big heart. And um, I'm glad I know you. Oh, Aaron. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, man. You are, you are a prime example the love of Christ. And um, thanks, Denise, for letting you hang out with me for this hour. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Room. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one song mix offer you know what's all around you every waking moment of your life marketing you're choking on it i'm scott robertson and when it comes to strategic pr branding and marketing i've seen it all and actually i'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps join me each week on may the best brand win right here on inner talk radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.